Welcome to the public AI Cafe on February 8th. And our speaker today is, as you see on my my right side, <laughs> maybe not your right side, Henning Müller. Hello, good to see you. Hello. From the University of Applied Science, Western Switzerland, and it's called HES minus SO. And with this talk on Examote, a practical approach towards using machine learning in histopathology. And next to me also is Emma. Emma is also our co-moderator. Hi, Emma. Hello. From Grassroot Arts. So in short, I am Carmen and as well, Emma are from Grassroot Arts. We are your moderators and co-organizers. And this cafe is part of the European research project AI for Media. We are all partners in this. Please take notice that the session will be recorded. And the recording will be later available in the AI Cafe video channels if the speaker gives me the permission for this. No confidential information shall be shared in this cafe session. All speakers express their personal views and opinions. This is not necessarily the official AI for Media project opinion. So, and what is this cafe about? The cafe offers a series of live web sessions. It's an online forum and participants get the chance to share knowledge. So the idea is that maybe after this cafe, you can even send each other emails and share experience or questions or knowledge. And of course, to meet stakeholders from the various areas of AI research. And today, is the, as we see, it's health and e-health. <laughs> and I'm very happy that you're here, the participants. Please use the chance to be interactive and send us questions during this cafe for the speaker. After the presentation of the speaker, uh, we will read your questions to him and we hope to get answers. But I want now to introduce Henning. He <laughs> is the main point why we are here. Henning Müller studied medical informatics at the University of Heidelberg in Germany and then worked at Daimler-Benz Research in Portland, Oregon, USA. From 1998 until 2002, he worked on his PhD degrees in degree in computer vision at the University of Geneva, Switzerland, with a research stay at Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. Since 2002, Henning has been working for the Medical Informatics Service at the University Hospital of Geneva. Since 2007, he has been a full professor at the HES-SO Valais. And since 2011, he's responsible for the e-health unit of the school. Since 2014, he's also a professor at the medical faculty of the University of Geneva. In 2015-16, he was on sabbatical at the Maritino Center, part of Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, USA, to focus on research activities. Henning is coordinator of the EXA Mode EU project and has been coordinator of the Freshmoy EU project, scientific coordinator of the Viscaral EU project. And since early 2020, He's also a member of the Swiss National Research Council. So it's impressive. Thank you, you are here, Henny. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it's like very impressive to have you here as our guest. And I will now turn over the moderation to you so you can make your presentation. And then later, as I said, we will make the question answer session. So I gave you now the moderator role. And so I'm sharing my screen and your screen. put the slides in yeah. Perfect. full screen mode. So I hope you can see my screen well. Yes. Perfect. So well, th thanks a lot for the introduction already, and thanks thanks also for the for the invitation. I mean, it's an AI <laughs> cafe, so I have my cup of coffee here. 
And I will share this coffee with you. So mm -hmm. I will mainly talk about uh, the Examode project, which uh, is a project on medical data analysis. I mean, you can let me see. I can. pointer and add some color. I mean, these are the kinds of images that we talk about in histopathology. So these are tissue samples, or in this case, it's a uh, suspected cancer and uh, it's very thinly sliced and then imaged. And these are the kind of things that we work on in the Examode project. I mean, I will mainly talk about Examode, but I will talk about a few other things as well that are quite important for me to really bring machine learning towards the medical field. And uh, part of it is also interpretability, explainability, and that is something where we work on also in the AI for Media project that uh, Carmen has already mentioned, that is also co-organizing these AI cafes. So I, I'd like to thank also the European Commission for the funding that uh, we've been receiving for uh, uh, for our work. And, uh, and uh, this image here is really sort of the workflow. I mean, there's not too much text in here, but uh, well, we look at images, uh, we look at text, and then we're trying to map these two to like uh, semantic representations and we cut everything into pieces uh, in terms of uh, like the, the slides, we cut them into patches. Then we try to identify what is actually in the patches so we can then work on the whole images. I mean, this is basically the same, but here it is segmented and you can see that we sort of put meaning to the images and, and help physicians then interpret what uh, what this is all about. And I mean, you already gave an introduction, so I don't need to talk about that much more, just that I've, I've always been sort of in between the medical faculty, computer science faculty, and I think it's uh, really what I'm most interested in to apply some of the techniques from computer science, machine learning to the medical field. And uh, I just want to stress how important it is that there are people who actually speak the two languages and can make the link between the two, because it can easily be misunderstood. And um, um, as you mentioned, we're, like part of the Autico uh, Spécialisé de Suisse Occidentale, so the HESSO. And this is where I'm right now, and uh, um, we're in the middle of the mountains. It's a small it's a small place here, it's a small city in the Swiss mountains in the southern part of Switzerland in, in Valais. This is the Rhone River, it's pretty small here. Um, it'll, it'll be much bigger when it, uh, when it reaches the Mediterranean uh, a bit later on. So what I will talk about today is uh, really presenting XMO with a focus on like some of the concrete problems that we have been tackling, like uh, getting away from manually labeled, like pixel wise labels of images towards like really weekly supervised learning, because it is one of the bottlenecks, not only getting access to medical data, but particularly getting access to annotated medical data. And then the second part that I've, I've always worked on since my PhD, basically, is multimodal analysis, multimodal learning. So checking text and images and see how we can actually combine these two and how we can use one maybe to uh, learn for the other as well. Interpretability, explainability is something that for me is really important to bring uh, um, the tools that we develop in machine learning, decision support into clinical practice, because we're not, it's a black box. And if we uh, have a, just a basic decision and give it to a physician, we we'll just say, so So what do we do with that? Because when you, when you have a patient in front of you, there's a lot more than just like an image to interpret or an image to analyze and, uh, and getting something out of it. For developing a treatment, for developing the best possible treatment for a patient, for example, you need a lot more information. It's also personal choices, but it's also background. Uh, other diseases, comorbidities, I mean, all of that needs to be taken into account. That's why this, to integrate known knowledge with uh, the outcome of decision support, I mean, that's really something that is important. And there's a big hype on medical machine learning, medical AI, and I've, I've, I've put here the a, a video, it's on YouTube, so I can I can share the slides and like that, you, you also have the video. It's Jeff Hinton, I think it's 2000, uh, 16, if I'm not wrong, so it was I think about seven years ago, where well, he was saying, oh, radiology, I mean, should stop training radiologists. It's over the cliff. I mean, they will all uh, uh, be out of out of jobs within within five years. AI will take over everything. And so far, that hasn't really happened. I mean, there's a lot of promises, and I think there's a lot of potential in AI. Sometimes we should pay attention to 
to what we say and how we go ahead with it, because there are also risks in it. And, and medical is a, it's a complex field. I mean, I've, I've just picked up a few random uh, headlines that I found on the internet, but it's like uh, machines do better jobs than humans and uh, deep mind AI beats doctors in breast cancer screening. And they also mention that they had looked at eye scans and had a neck cancer and these kind of things. Uh, so, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about that for quite a while. I mean, this was 2016, 2020. So then, I mean, AR hype exaggeration facts. So the people were getting a bit more like also suspicious. Is it really working in that way? Because most of the time uh, they were doing like this on, on closed data set. So data set from one hospital at one time that was taken out. And then you were basically predicting the past. I mean, we're very good in predicting the past, so having closed data. Set. We're not very good in predicting the future. And um, well, Google's medical AI was super accurate in the lab. I mean, real life was a different story. So it worked until it didn't work anymore. And I mean, there's Google flu trends in a similar way. It worked pretty well for a while, but then it, at some point it, it, it didn't predict correctly anymore because there's a lot of changes in behavior, modifications, and I think that's what we need to pay attention to. Um, and that's also something that we, when we evaluate what AI does, we actually need to look at like, what is actually the impact? I mean, quite often we can really separate different diseases very, very well. They're all treated exactly the same way. I mean, there's no point in doing that actually. Clinically speaking, it doesn't matter. I mean, the precise diagnosis is important when there's a different treatment, but many, Many diseases are actually treated in a very similar way. So we also need to pay attention to that. And it's actually, much of it is actually a question of trust as well. I mean, what do patients say? Do they want to be treated by AI? Or maybe do they want to talk to their physicians to, to do that? I mean, there's a, a couple of questions. And uh, there's actually a web page, AI Meath, that uh, talks about some of these things about like uh, 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 how much you can promise, how much it, uh, like super intelligence. It's, uh, I mean, now with chat GPT, we can see there's a whole hype around it. I mean, some of the things are very impressive, but we also need to pay attention to what does it do? What does it not do? And how can we use it? And how should we not use it? Because also chat GPT, I mean, some of the things are impressive, but sometimes it also does make mistakes that are, we very clearly see that, I mean, this is not human. So that was a bit of an introduction to uh, this cafe uh, and on the project. Uh, XMO was funded uh, by the Euro Commission, European Commission in a call from, from 2020. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it was a call on big data and very large scale data analysis. And histopathology is historically, I mean, even now you, you take tissue samples, you put them under glass, you color them, and then you put them under a microscope. Now there are whole slide scanners, so you can scan these images, but these images are big. A single image is often 10 gigabytes in size, 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. Um, often if you have cancer, you want to cut pieces of different parts of the cancer because one tumor might actually consist of four or five completely different areas inside the tumor that you need to analyze to be able to, to determine what is the best treatment for this specific tumor. So often we have five, 10, 15 slides of like 10 gigabytes for a single patient. And if, for example, in a regional hospital here in, in Valais, um, I think they have 400,000 whole slide images that they produce like glass slides per year. 10, 10 gigabytes, I mean, you can calculate how much that is. It's much more than they could possibly digitally store. And that's why uh, this project was also funded because we're in a domain where the amount of data is exploding. Treating it in a digital way can have really many advantages in terms of decision support, in terms of also quantifying some of the outcomes because this is a very qualitative domain still. And that's what I will talk about a little bit more. And how we've been having like a really practical approach. I mean, that's already seen in the partners. I mean, we're only basically two academic partners, two universities. We are, our own university works on uh, more the imaging side, image analysis and machine learning. And then we have a partner at the University of Padova working on the text side, um, text ontology uh, uh, discovery. And then we have uh, two industrial partners, 
onto text in microscope IT. They have two blooks like they, they have taken over. Um, and uh, onto text really works on the semantic side. Again, now much in collaboration with part of our microscope IT, more on the imaging side, image management side. And like this, we were able to really make sure that what the academic partners do is being taken up by the industrial partners. And then we have uh, two hospitals. I mean, Radboud University Medical Center has a very strong machine learning based unit as well. So they uh, uh, also work on the image analysis part, but they also have the clinicians inside the, their institution. And the hospital in Catania uh, or Catagirona now, they, they really have the physicians and they have a fully digital workflow where they can really make us profit from, from, from what they are doing. And you can see also that there's a a good geographical spread of the project with the, within the group. That is a bit the outline uh, of the project. So what we wanted to do, as I said, we take clinical images. Uh, this is what we have here. So uh, both hospitals provide images that are scanned at high resolution and that are made available. And both hospitals also have uh, pathology reports that we then, where we analyze the text and where we take then the text to actually learn uh, on, on the images. And at the same time, something we've been working on for several years is also taking the biomedical literature and then filter out images that are actually relevant to, to what we're doing. Uh, because literature images have quite different characteristics compared to uh, the, the clinical ones. They're very varied. I mean, they oversample rare cases, i.e. typical cases. And that's actually what we want in, uh, in a system. Then we have here, that's basically right about, they pick up the knowledge discovery data part that we've been doing, the semantic aspects, and then develop tools that can then be used by the hospitals, but also the company partners uh, to exploit what uh, we've been doing. Answering questions to clinicians, looking into scenarios where uh, what we are developing really helps the clinician in taking the decisions, in preparing the report, and possibly adding quantitative data to this part. So, as I said, we, when we wrote the project five years ago, we, um, we were looking into um, how, how we can solve some of the challenges that we had in medical machine learning. One of them was very clearly, I mean, we now can get access to data. I mean, several data sets have been made publicly available, but getting annotations in pixel level annotations is very expensive. So that's something that we wanted to solve. We wanted to work with weak labels. If possible, weak labels that we could extract more or less automatically. Here we were looking at pathology reports. So we extract labels from the reports and then we use that to learn on the image data, trying to find which part of an image corresponds to specific labels and how can we then quantify, for example, the surface of specific grade of cancer in the images so we can see what are the most frequent grades, um, how much has the cancer progressed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to then plan, plan the treatment training. So really looking at this multimodality, looking at different data sources, making all of this scalable. So we are working, I mean, if a hospital, like a regional hospital produces 400,000 slides, we need to be able to treat those. And currently, with our local infrastructures, that's very difficult. That's why we actually added the National Computing Center, SIFSARA, into the project, because they could easily supply access to thousands of GPUs and hundreds of thousands of CPUs, massive storage, but also safe space where we can run the computation. So where the data are only accessible for people who really have access to them. And then looking at secondary data sources that are free of charge, that are increasing in size. So it's uh, it has been, increasing the volume, the number of images uh, in the biomedical literature has been increasing almost exponentially over the last 15 or 20 years. And both times, both for the clinical parts, we have text, and for biomedical literature, we also have text that we can work on. We then were choosing like four domains that we wanted to work on in the project. We wanted to choose domains where we have a large number of images. So it's a high workload for histopathology departments because they have uh, often screening programs, so they get many tissue samples, um, which also means that there's a high economic value, which is what is important also for the uh, um, uh, for the commercial partners in a project. So they can really exploit the outcomes directly with uh, histopathology departments and 
provide tools and products out of what we are doing. And we have three cancers, colon, lung, and cervix uterus. But then we also wanted to have one non-oncologic domain. So we decided to take celiac disease because it's increasing in the number. So there are more people who have a gluten allergy now than maybe 20, 25 years ago. And people are aware of it. So there's a larger number of analyses and possibly also like a high impact on the life of people with these diseases. And that's how we ended up in this pipeline. So extracting labels, mapping them onto an ontology, cutting these images into small patches, and then checking which of these concepts apply to specific patches. So we can then train a classifier, develop tools for segmentation, for staging, grading, quantification, like that giving the physicians in, in, like uh, input for preparing the reports, um, but also input on how to prepare the treatment decisions, because that's, that's what's the important part in the end. So initially, when, when we started, we were looking at these uh, four areas. We also used prostate in, in the very beginning because we already had a large data set available. And we had experience with uh, this field from um, a previous project that was uh, funded as a, as a Eurostars project, so collaboration between academic partners and industry. And what you can see here is the number of images. I mean, it might not seem impressive in terms of the number of images, but if you have 20,000 images that are 10 gigabytes, I mean, that's still a massive amount of data. Um, same thing here, we, we're looking at like, they, these are proprietary data, so that's what we acquire in our hospital. Uh, usually most of them come from like uh, uh, the Calta Girona Hospital or Radboud Medical Center. And then we had a few, like uh, this one small data set from Bern University that we could use. These were tissue microarrays, they were publicly available, for example. But then we also checked uh, um, like data sets that were accessible via scientific challenges or the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCIA, the Cancer Imaging Archive. And we also looked at the literature, we filtered out everything like histopathology images, then we checked in the text whether it's human or animal tissue, we checked that uh, uh, it uh, well, concerns human, it concerns a specific organ and uh, uh, other related information. So what we can see, I mean, we have a lot of proprietary information, but we also have 13,000 host light images that are publicly available, and then a very large number of smaller scale images that are there. Each time, this is like um, uh, a journal article with the figure caption and then the images, and this is a clinical image with uh, uh, a clinical document, clinical like a pathology report in this case. And in the project, initially we started then developing applications. This is Virtum, a viewer that was developed uh, by Microscope IT. So that allowed us to A, have a platform for developing tools, so for detection, segmentation. On the other hand, we could also manually annotate regions because, I mean, we did use strong labels, particularly in the beginning of the project, to make sure that whatever we develop with weak labels, we can test performance and can make sure that it actually works well. Um, many people who are trying to work in medical imaging, they say, oh, there's no data that uh, images are not accessible. It's very difficult to get access to data. I mean, that can be true in many fields, but with uh, uh, funding agencies actually pushing towards open data, open science, uh, particularly the National Institutes of Health in the US, I mean, they require publicly funded projects to make the data also publicly available, sometimes with a bit of a delay after the end of the project, for example, but there's a push for that. So um, that means that we can actually get much more. I mean, the, the TCGA, TCIA, are very large repositories with hundreds of thousands of different types of images. There are many scientific challenges. I mean, I'm involved in the image clay challenges, but there are many challenges on Kaggle, uh, 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 et cetera, where people can participate where the images are then made available. And we also have these images from the biomedical literature. And so this is, uh, PubMed Central is really a central repository where people can upload their articles when they're NIH funded, but also where automatically all of the uh, uh, biomedical literature that is uh, indexed in PubMed is, is indexed as well. And I mean, here, so we can see that at least like since like the 
mid 90s there's an almost exponential increase in the number of images that are available on PubMed and so journals either, either new journals that are open access or existing journals uh, were, that have become open access over time when we use this i mean what we can see is there are way more than 20 million images but many of them are like these images here, so you have compound figures, so little patches that correspond to something, so we actually need to cut them apart. So we try to do that in an as automated way as possible, but, but it doesn't always work perfectly well. We also have many lookalikes. I mean, this is a histopathology image, but it's drawn by hand, so it's not a real one. Somebody tried to actually simulate it. I mean, you can, all of these, uh, uh, here, I mean, this look, looks more like like an ECG signal, for example, or um, this is just a skin picture, but without anything that would make you think that this is uh, um, uh, similar in texture to uh, to this. But for an algorithm, it actually is, and here even even worse. But I think by quickly looking at it, you get a feeling for how 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 this actually happened. And to make the images usable, we uh, created already a while ago, over 10 years ago, uh, for the image click challenge, actually, um, um, hierarchy of image types. So we checked what is actually present in the literature. So we looked at these 20 million images, we separated them, we checked like what are the medical, like uh, everything linked to radiology, the modalities that are available. We then have uh, like uh, visible light microscopy, we have, 3D reconstruction of data, uh, microscopy, uh, printed signals like 1D signals, ECG um, uh, or EEG. And then we have general biomedical uh, illustrations. And this is actually something that we sort of try to separate the clinical image, diagnostic images from the more generic one. Um, so that's one part. So we had to identify the figure type, then we had to identify whether an image is a compound figure, so we need to further cut it apart. I mean, currently doing that with, with uh, a part of the data, but there's uh, there's a really massive amount to treat. And then once we have identified, so in our case, uh, the visible light microscopy, um, we can then uh, uh, go ahead and check like what else do we need to know. And one question, I mean, we hadn't. We hadn't seen in the beginning, but that's actually important. Is is it human or animal tissue? Because there are animals who might have a prostate or a breast or an uterus. So like I mean, we need to take that into account. That's not what we want because obviously the tissue is different. Disease models might also be be quite different. So we check first like human versus animal tissue. Then we can check, and that is usually manually classified in most PubMed articles. So they have manually attached mesh terms, keywords, um, um, and that includes usually the human versus animal, and it includes also the organ or several organs that are concerned. And then we might have specific labels for diseases or grading, staging uh, images, um, which is then going towards the question that we're asking from the medical side. So these are the classes that we then have for, for, for the machine learning. And obviously we want to use these images to improve our training. So we want a large set of images that allows us then to generalize well. And as I mentioned, I mean, medical natural language processing, it, it, some of the things are not too difficult, but some of them are really hard. And what we can see is many abbreviations are not necessarily classical or standard uh, abbreviations that are used. And I mean, you can also see, I just took this out of uh, 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 like uh, Wikipedia somewhere, and you can see AB can mean acid base ratio. It can be abdomen, abortion, antibody. So uh, airway breathing circulation also starts with AB. So there's, a, there's many, much, much, much overlap between these types. And we have spelling mistakes because often documents are very quickly written. Sometimes you have technical knowledge, like Latinized terms, synonyms for the same thing. And again, when we map uh, whatever we uh, extract onto an ontology, then we can actually make sure that two different terms are actually put together if if they represent really the, the same concept. We then have like sometimes nested phrases, complex phrases, and then we need to pay attention uh, uh, also that people actually 
understand what exactly this corresponds to. And negation detection, it's a, it's a topic where people write a PhD thesis on. Um, and I mean, there's also several levels of negation. It's only, not only yes, negated or non-negated, but little evidence of. The question is, what, what does that actually mean? I mean, it doesn't mean no. Um, it's not completely yes either. So we actually need to deal with these kind of, uh, of questions. Um, we need to check, uh, sometimes there are double negations, for example, how we can deal with that. And I mentioned that there's many synonyms. So, I mean, cardiac arrest can be named also heart attack, a heart failure, my, myocardial infarction, heart arrest, coronary thrombosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many different ways of actually saying the same thing. Um, and as I mentioned, the big advantage of literature images is A, they're um, really available. So here, by, uh, like PubMed Central, can be downloaded by, by everybody. There are like a few million zip files that everybody can download, each one for like one journal article with a PDF, some of the metadata, uh, et cetera. And usually in, in the literature, people describe like the unusual, untypical cases, which is usually where we have few from. Like if we want to do learning quite often for like rare diseases or rare conditions with like one, two cases. And then the question is, how, how do we compare that to, to other things? We also have images from many laboratories. And again, one of the challenges of machine learning in the medical field is that images in different institutions often have different characteristics as well. So here, um, we really want to make sure that we have this diversity of images so we can check. Do we want to have like a properly stained image, everybody the same, or do we want to work on data augmentations because some of the tools that we use, like, a, uh, like an X-ray scanner or, or like a, a specific camera would actually have uh, similar characteristics. So we want to increase generalizability of the learned models based on the diversity of images that we put in and that we're trying to uh, inquire. And this is exponentially increasing accounts. So it's, it's really been going up very, very quickly. And um, I, I'm pretty convinced that this will actually continue in one way or another over the coming years. Then when we have these images extracted, as I said, we already know if it is cancer or not, like what, what which body part is concerned. We have an idea about uh, who might have it in, in our environment. And um, uh, but some of the things we don't know, I mean, we don't know what is the magnification or pixel size in literature images. Magnification is sort of a fuzzy concept because it depends on how the image was taken and how much, uh, how much effort is actually taken in, in properly looking at these parameters. Whereas some of the other tools like, uh, uh, um, I mean, um, we, we might have, uh, a better feeling for for the size of it. But here we we don't we don't know the size of the pixel, and uh, we actually need to identify in which scale we're working, and that's why we are actually trying to detect that automatically. I mean, for that we have images where we have all the metadata available. We know the pixel size, so we can generate uh, much training data automatically at different scales, and then we should do a brute force approach, or we can segment the nuclei and then check. How does this correspond? We did the two approaches. We also combined them. We checked what works in under which conditions to really look at uh, how to optimize that. And then for images that we have from the literature, we can actually generate these these metadata. And we have a variety of other tools. And this is a recent article that was just published in in January, where we actually look at different color variations. We generated the data set from the literature, from private sources, public sources. Uh, with over 2 million different real color variations that exist in H and E stained images. This is the standard staining uh, that is that is used for for most of histopathology images. There are then very precise immunohistochemistry uh, stainings as well, but this is something that we've, we've not worked on as much because most of the images we're getting are actually stained in, in H and E. And the objective of, of this tool was to optimize the staining uh, normalization or data augmentation for staining uh, with machine learning. So we generated here these two million color variations, and then we checked whether 
uh, an augmented image that we created corresponds to like some of the real uh, um, color variations that exist. And like that, we actually generate a training set that is more compact, so more efficient, but also we can show that it works much, much better than other state-of-the-art algorithms that we compared to. And then we worked on these supervised, like semi-supervised or weekly supervised approaches. So we took um, strongly annotated data set, trained a, a teacher model, used this model on a weekly annotated data set, and everything what we have is sufficiently high confidence in the label. We can then use that to uh, train a student model. That we can then uh, refine with all of the strongly annotated data again. And we could show that this actually works, works better than taking only the strongly annotated data, which we often have in limited quantities. And uh, we then continued this path from like these more or less manually attached labels, where we check the reports, to, um, oops, to automatically generating these entities. For that, we created domain ontology. Um, uh, we then looked at the like named entity recognition looking at entity linking, putting things together, so we could then generate the labels more or less automatically. I mean, on the right-hand side, you can see in, on different data sets, we can see that these classes here for colon cancer, for example, actually, we can fairly easily separate the, uh, the different classes, and the algorithm we're using actually do work pretty well on, uh, on these aspects. And we then continued, actually, to, to look at uh, 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 other aspects of like multimodal data, what could use that. This was uh, uh, published in the Nature Partner Journal on Digital Medicine, where we really auto completely automated the approach. So we uh, the, uh, the main ontology, we had ideas of what are the terms that are linked to ontology items. And then we have the links between images and, uh, and the text reports. And so we analyzed the text reports, generated the labels, and in a completely automated way, trained the model it actually had really good results. But as a practical approach, I mean, we developed also a variety of other tools, partner Radboud University, they're maintaining this grand challenge.org web page, and they actually developed sort of a, an app store for different applications that are used or are useful also for histopathology imaging, which would then allow us as well to, to, to work more on these specific uh, aspects and tools and really share these tools. Pretty much everything we developed in the project is available on GitHub. So if you have any uh, questions on them, I mean, don't hesitate to, to contact me. So that was on the multimodal learning, the weekly supervised learning or semi-supervised learning. And as I said, one of the things that I'm currently working on uh, quite a bit is really the question of interpretability or explainability of deep learning, so deep neural networks. Because we want to make these decisions understandable and really remove the black box image. So uh, A, we can validate that the decisions that are made are sound, so it's clear, the decision was taken, why this decision was taken. And so uh, a non-expert in machine learning could actually take these results out, combine them with what they know on the patients, and then really uh, work on uh, solutions for treatment planning uh, uh, and diagnosis. because. In the medical field, I mean, the impact of wrong, wrong decisions is, is massive and uh, it can impact people's lives. I mean, there are many approaches to, um, uh, to, um, to interpretability, explainability. And one of the things we realized also in the XM mode, uh, no, in the AI for Media project, there are so many terms that like interpretability, explainability, transparency, accountability, fairness, uh, in, uh, and transparency is then opposite to opacity, we can have bias, reliable AI, robust AI, uncertainty, confidence. Into, I mean, there's a variety of terms. So we actually held a workshop, uh, um, work, workshop webpage, I think is still available. And the outcomes are now published in uh, a journal called Artificial Intelligence Reviews, where this is available. And uh, it, it also includes parts on like what are the rights and obligations when we use medical data inside a GDPR compliant uh, development? And also regionally, our government is interested in looking at like how this can be linked to, to other tasks. To, uh, to, so we, what we're doing is actually make sense also from a rec regulatory perspective. Here we have these different terms. I mean, we have 
the legal field, philosophy, sociology, labor, cognitive sciences, and the technology part. And then we check who uses what terms and how are these terms related and how can we define them. So we define these terms uh, for the different domains, make comparison what is often understood in different way. And then we took work of uh, Google Brain, Bain Kim, and she, she developed what's called concept activation vectors. So she was looking at specific concepts that occur in images. I mean, this is zebra likeliness. Um, so if it is zebra like, then I mean, chances are high that it, it is uh, in one way or another a zebra in the image. So we're trying to do something along similar lines. So instead of having these concept activation vectors, um, this was actually called regression concept vectors because we didn't want to have binary concepts, but rather a continuum of, uh, of this. I mean, if we look at enlarged nuclei, I mean, you can see that here, uh, there's not only like the small ones and big ones, we have anything in between, and we then need to check how, um, uh, how we can actually uh, combine this. And here, what we do, I mean, we map, for example, we know that nuclei size has an influence at, at least for, for prostate, for example, and also for colon, uh, with like uh, heterogeneity you get when you have cancer. We also have the internal heterogeneity. So how heterogeneous uh, such a specific cell is, we can look at the borders. Again, higher diversity in the borders gives us an impact on, uh, um, uh, on, on how aggressive a cancer might be. And we can actually use that in, in many different ways. I mean, if we know which part of a network is related to specific things, and we can identify this via the features, then we can remove these parts. And what we did as one example is we took ImageNet, we pre-trained with ImageNet, then we checked which parts of the network are uh, responsible for uh, scale invariance, because that's in like very standardized images like histopathology, that's not what we actually want. And then, we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can actually check out how we can get the uh, the best possible performance. What we could see is actually the performance improved quite a bit by basically removing the scale invariance because scale has an important role. I mean, in ImageNet, everybody wants to be scale invariant, so we have objects in all different sizes. Whereas here, we know that images are almost always pr taken in pretty much the same resolution. And then we can uh, 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 we we can really see that if the nuclei are enlarged, I mean that that has a meaning, and that is something we lose actually when we use these uh, completely pre-trained network. And we also used uh, some of these approaches to then do visualizations, check with clinicians what they are most interested in. I mean, I will go quickly over it, but you can see, I mean, we can have these sort of object-like structures. We can have more or less clean things. We can also have boxes where we have positive and negative effects. So we have one small regions with a high negative effect and larger region around it with a, a better. This is actually what, what clinicians in the end prefer, not these extremely precise part, but rather something where we have a broad outline because I think it's also easier to, to read and find. And then we, um, one thing that I haven't worked on myself, but that I feel is very important in this concept, is really the question of continuous learning. Because one of the difficulties of, uh, of implementing AI in the medical field is really that the images change over time. So a CT scanner in Switzerland is replaced every five, six years. So I think in Geneva there are seven or eight CT scanners. So you can pretty much every year there's one uh, or two that are being replaced. And that means that we create different images. So a newer CT scanner would not produce images in exactly the same way. Sometimes there are really big differences. Sometimes the differences are tiny. But AI actually is very good in detecting these differences and, and, and possibly actually being screwed by these differences. So there's a possibility if we have regularly added images that we can actually create a loop where um, we retrain every now and then, and then check how, how well the performance is doing. And um, I'm now reaching the 40-minute mark, so I'm at my conclusions. So I think what I wanted to say is that really interpretability of deep learning is for me like a, a key part to in, integrate into clinical workflows. We need to be able to explain what we do also to, to understand 
bias in our data to understand possibly incorrect uh, decisions. And then with Excel mode, we direct many of the really practical changes in machine learning, looking at scalability. So if we have hundreds of thousands of images, would our quality get better? Or maybe we don't need that. I mean, that's something we need to find out. We also want to learn from weak labels. That's what we did, and it actually works really, really well. And learn from multimodal data, again, to really profit, have one media profit from, from another one. And um, there's more information available on our web page. All our publications are on our publication page. And I mean, if you're interested in Excel mode, do not hesitate to also check out the web page. And then if there are any questions, don't, don't hesitate to contact me. I think what we can see uh, is that this is really work of a team. So it's uh, not me actually doing that work, but it's, it's really a whole team. And, uh, and they deserve the credit for all of the cool tools that we develop. And you can get in contact with them. You can get access to code. And many data sets that we develop are also shared. And that's pretty much it. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm now open for, for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Annie. This was hyper interesting. And yes, also to the participants, please send us questions because now it's the time for Q&A. Um, so I would like to start the question session. Um, how can I imagine in the future or now uh, that really your software is integrated in the, busy in the clinical uh, process? Um, so I come as a patient to the hospital. I you think I have um, possibly cancer. Where does it come in and who checks the results? So in, in principle, like when you get to histopathology imaging, it means that a, bias, a biopsy has been taken. So there's a suspicion for cancer. Sometimes cancer is actually confirmed. You take a bit of tissue and then you analyze it to actually check what is actually present. So it could be a benign tumor or it could be a malignant tumor. Um, and if it is a benign tumor, you need to check what is the severity. So is it, is it really advanced? Has it destroyed the tissue? Has it metastasized? Uh, and so these are the kind of questions that are then answered, answered. So you can check if there are metastases in the tissue, for example. That's a detection uh, challenge that has been done in like, I think it's called the chameleon challenge, where lymph node metastases are, are to be detected. And those who detected most of them had than the best results. I mean, that is one thing. Another is if you take several uh, examples of a tumor, you could check um, what is the staging grading information for prostate cancer, for example. It's a question of do you operate or not? Mm -hmm. What is the level when you start operating? What is the level when you continue observing or maybe do some, using like radiotherapy, which is a much less invasive uh, uh, procedure, which also depends on the uh, on what the students uh, the, the students the patients actually want because it's also a question of like quality of life it's personal decisions what type of treatment you you might want to have but that's a bit the scenario that uh, that you can have okay I I will now directly go to a question of Tony yeah. and then later we go to Emma thank you for do you have evidence that clinical decision support actually improves um, it's one of the most uh, like uh, difficult things is actually to show clinical impact, even though many of the algorithms actually work really well. And it has been shown that, I mean, often algorithms are similar in performance to humans and often a human with an algorithm actually has better performance than humans. So this is something that uh, that is often done. And I mean, you can check that the, the that the performance is then very high. But from there to be able to show uh, actually clinical impact, it's it's a few steps further because we would need to have pro uh, prospective trials where we do an analysis on new data sets. So all of this is retrospective. So we're working on closed data sets and not on new problems where we have additional challenges. And it, I mean, there are several tools that have shown good performance, but clinical impact is, uh, is another story. One of the things where, AI has been used in, in radiology departments, for example, in Geneva, is these like very quick screening, uh, tr like uh, um, where, you, uh, where you have a triage at the entrance, for example, of emergency radiology. So you, every image goes through uh, an AI that assesses the risk. You need a quick uh, 
uh, uh, response on that. And what they discovered was that quite often I mean, there are many false positives. So the, the software shows up images and they're like, oh, this might be a tumor, but then it isn't. But they also found a couple of images where like, for example, they had cerebral bleeding, which was missed by a radiologist when they quickly looked at it and then they didn't do the reading. But, but this patient would need like instant treatment. And by having the tool, I mean, it's extremely fast. It goes through and it's a question of seconds. And when the algorithm says like, oh, there's cerebral bleeding, I mean, everybody would just go for it, take the patient and uh, make sure that the patient is treated instantly. And so they had several of these cases that were actually missed by a radiologist, but then it was found by the software. So these kind of things, I think there you can directly see the, the clinical impact. Of it. And even if it's just like a few cases, maybe a few cases mm -hmm. a year, uh, the impact is very strong. Yes, thank you. Now, Emma, maybe if it's if you have a question. Yes. Do you already have um, a plan for a new project? I mean, we're currently working on that. I mean, we're looking at the EU calls because our project is finishing at the end of June. So we would like to keep at least some of the partners together to see like how we can go towards something else. As cancer for the new calls is taken out of many of the medical calls, we're also looking into non-cancer areas. I mean, there's a variety. I mean, um, uh, celiac disease is, is, is one direction that uh, we're looking into. Interstitial lung disease could be another. I mean, it's similar to lung cancer, but it's different anomalies. It's not as much data, but it's a very large heterogeneity of, uh, of disease and possibly different treatments. That is something we're currently looking into. I mean, if you have a great idea for a project, I mean, don't hesitate to contact us. We're very happy to submit with you as well. <laughs> so, Emma, no? you heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's your chance. And uh, here comes Leo Kakainen. Uh, Have you looked at the stable diffusion as an alternative to CNNs? To, I, I think, stable diffusion to? As an alternative to CNNs. Neur, uh, to see neural networks. Um, no, I, myself, I haven't looked into that directly. But again, if you have an interesting article, I mean, don't hesitate to to send it to me. I'd be, I'd be happy to to look at that. It's maybe it continues. He uh, continues. The difference <laughs> of the X-ray images could be modeled by just using all the images taken and then learn the transformation in between. It should mm -hmm. be a standard procedure before taking a new machine in the process. Please. I mean, oh yeah. So that is then about like the um, the continuous learning, I think, because when we do machine replacements, I mean, currently because AI is not routinely used, but it's more or less it's like in Geneva at least it's tested in clinical routine. So there are no procedures for this continuous learning for the replacement of machine. But it's true. I mean, we would actually need to identify. How do we add a new machine? How do we make sure that whatever we have learned from the past data actually works as well with new machine? So it generalizes to, to the new machines. But, but that is, uh, I think, also something where we definitely need more, um, more research on to make sure that we're not forgetting what we learned before. So it works on old data, but it also works on new data with possibly different characteristics. OK, thank you. And here comes Sven. Sven else. Um, he asked, so your algorithms, AI, APIs, are they then up for sale to companies who produce such scanners? Um, currently, um, I mean, most of what we do is open source, so we don't sell what we do. Um, some of them, are, I mean, there are APIs for the ones, I think, on uh, grandchallenge.org, so I think they can also be used free of charge. We sometimes co uh, collaborate with companies and then, I mean, the intellectual proper rights directly uh, goes to the companies. We had done that on prostate cancer, for example, in the Eurostars project, and then all of the intellectual proper rights were with the company. But, but we have different models. I mean, we collaborate with, with companies for some of these uh, things if our research is funded on that. Um, I mean, I've been involved, I've been in advisory board of several startup companies as well, but I've, I've never created a startup myself. And the histopathology field is quite busy. I mean, there are quite a few startups uh, already on the market, so we would need to, to really get active in it. We would need to check what um, 
um, what added value would we have? Okay. Yes, and now it comes back to my own questions. As I listened to your presentation, um, you said you're using public available data, especially mm -hmm. in US, um, also there are large databases. And um, and I also heard that you are publishing your software on GitHub and mm -hmm. you publish your data. Uh, I didn't get it. When we can, I mean, that depends on the um, ethics agreements that we have with the data providers. I mean, we're trying whenever we can to publish our data sets as well. We've made available several data sets. Data sets from the biomedical literature, many of them are available publicly um, because in uh, PubMed Central, all the articles have a Creative Commons license attached to them. Many of them allow redistribution with uh, uh, um, while citing the original sources. And that's that's what we quite often do. So we keep the links to, to the original images and articles, and then we release subsets of that for, for further use for, for other people, for example. And okay. same thing for clinical images. I mean, sometimes uh, uh, if they are fully anonymous, sharing uh, becomes possible and relatively easy. And if that is uh, okay for the ethics committees, then we try to release the data. But it needs to be made, like when we make the request for an ethics protocol, we need to request to have uh, to, to publish the data sets and share them with the scientific community. Most often it's for research use, I mean, also for companies who do research, but not for commercial exploitation. Yes. Okay. And I would like to um, slowly stop our cafe. We're coming to an end. I want to thank everybody. Leo also sent a uh, link to paper on stable diffusion and medical domain i will um, send it further to you um Hanning, and he thanks for the excellent talk well, <laughs> so, thank you <laughs> right so let's give the compliment and the and i will uh, the same way if there's more questions um, i think you are you can reach to handing out and um thank you emma for being here thank for everybody and the recording will be sent to you, Henning, and you mm -hmm. say yes, no, green or red light. If it's green light, then it's available on our AI for Media site as well as on YouTube AI Cafe channels, as always. And if you feel like out there being a speaker, please contact me, Carmen at Grassroot Arts. And thank you again and have a nice afternoon. And see you hopefully <laughs> one day again in the cafe. <laughs> bye bye. No? Well, thank thank you very much uh, for the bye. invitation. Bye bye. bye, -bye.